Hi everyone, so today we're going to talk about infinite geometric sequences and T2's lemma. So like we've seen before, T2's lemma is just a, you know, a special case, you can say, of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. But it has a lot of you know, special applications on its own merit. And this is one perfect example of that. So without wasting any time, let's just get right into this. So this is the problem number 3 from the IMO in 1982. And in this video, we're going to be talking about infinite geometric sequences, T2's lemma. And of course, we have certain book sessions of senior math Olympias and at the end, a similar but challenging problem. This video is sponsored by Chinta.com. Since 2010, Chinta has trained thousands of students from all around the world in mathematical Olympiads, physics Olympiads, computer science and informatics Olympiads, ISI CMI entrances, and research projects for school and college students. Okay. So they're saying consider infinite sequences Xn of positive reals such that X0 is 1. So zero term or the beginning term is 1 and all of the subsequent terms are less than or equal to that. So essentially this is the greatest and then you have less than or equal to. Right? All the subsequent terms are like that. Right, so it's essentially, it's either an equality case where all the terms are equal or it's diminishing, right? The subsequent terms are diminishing. Could be either of the two possibilities. Then they're saying that prove the following for natural number n. And actually this result, I'm just going to mark this as number one because you're going to see in the future, this is actually going to be very important to a lot of the things that we're doing. And this will come to know when we uh, get into this a little bit more. But anyways, so we need to prove the following for natural number n. For every such sequence, there is an n greater than or equal to 1, such that it satisfies this given inequality. So basically, in other words, they are in a way asking us to find a natural number n such that it satisfies this given inequality or find a range of natural numbers n such that it satisfies this given inequality. There may be more than one natural number, that's essentially my point. And, but we need to prove that there is at least one natural number n such that this given inequality is sat satisfied. That's part number one. And part number two is that find a sequence so that for all n, or in other words, we need to find a sequence for all natural numbers so that all natural numbers satisfy this given inequality, right? Which is quite fascinating. Okay, so yeah, let's just dive right into it. The first thing that I kind of observe is this thing. And that's present both in the uh, part one and part two. And that is actually something similar to what we've studied before. Of course, you might have guessed it, it is T2's lemma, right, or T2's inequality. So what does T2's inequality state? It just states that x0 squared divided by x1 plus x1 squared divided by x2 sum all the way up to xn minus 1 squared divided by xn. This is indeed greater than or equal to x0 plus x1 all the way up to xn minus 1 whole squared divided by x0 plus, sorry, x1, we have x1 here, plus x2 all the way up to xn. So this is what we know as a direct consequence of T2's inequality. And it just so happens <laughs> that uh, the left hand side on this inequality, and in fact, for both parts is actually, you know, what we see in the T2's lemma. So they're just directly hinting us to use T2's lemma, like giving us to write up that, okay, use T2's lemma over here, right? And we need to prove that this is greater than or equal to 3.999, right? That is what we have. Okay, perfect. So how can we maybe work with this? So I'm going to introduce a little bit of notation over here. I'm just going to call this entire left hand side as K because I don't want to be writing that whole thing again. And again, I'll just call that as K. And um, also I'm going to let X1 plus X2 all the way up to Xn minus one to be equal to S. Right, so that again, we can simplify the writing work over here. So basically we know that K is greater than or equal to X naught plus S whole squared divided by s plus xn, right? Just using this notation from on T2's lemma, right? That is it. Now, they've actually given us the value of x0. It is 1, right? Look here, x0, the value of x0 is 1. So if we just plug that in, I'll get k is greater than or equal to 1 plus s whole squared divided by s plus xn, which is amazing. So now I can just expand this out. So this just becomes 1 plus s squared plus 2s divided by s plus xn. So just kind of dividing it a little bit over here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this in a little bit of a different way. I'm just going to divide by 2 and multiply by 2 over here. 
and over here i'm just going to divide both the numerator and denominator by s so this just becomes 1 plus xn by s right if we divide both the numerator and denominator by s now i know for a fact that 1 plus s square by 2 is actually greater than or equal to s right uh greater than or equal to s why because you can just use you know amg inequality over here essentially 1 plus s square by 2 becomes greater than or equal to square root of s square but that's just s over here so k is essentially greater than or equal to um s times 2 over s plus xn and obviously you have this 2 over here 1 plus xn by s now if i do something similar over here if i do something similar for this term essentially dividing the numerator and denominator by s what i can essentially see that this is nothing but really s times 2 s i can take common 1 plus xn by s that is literally the same thing plus 2 1 plus xn by s so this and this gets cancelled so effectively what we're left with is is that k is greater than or equal to 4 divided by 1 plus xn by s and i'm just going to label that as result number 2 okay great so just to remind you s s was nothing but x1 plus x2 plus you know all the way till xn minus 1 so if i just divide s by xn it will be x1 by xn plus x2 by xn you know all the way till xn minus 1 by xn but if you actually remember i talked about something that i marked in equation number one right this given condition and i, I told you that's that's a very important condition what it's telling us is that you know each of the subsequent terms that either equal to the previous term or they're diminishing in magnitude you know, it goes something like this so essentially what will happen is if i write the right hand side as xn by xn plus xn by xn you know plus all the little xn by xn i'm replacing all xi's with xn's so this is actually going to be great s by xn is going to be greater than that why because you're replacing this think about it like this you're replacing x1 with xn but x1 is a greater value x1 is a greater value similarly x2 is a greater value x3 is a greater value than xn at the nth term the nth term is the smallest term and if you're replacing it with the smallest term obviously the value on the right hand side is going to become small so of course it is smaller than or equal to s by xn i think that's very clear so this is just uh, one added up n minus one times right so effectively we have s over xn is greater than or equal to n minus 1 or in other words xn by s is less than or equal to 1 by n minus 1 so basically here we had something similar xn by s if we just plug this into equation number 2 so use this in result number 2 i'll get something very nice i'll get that k is greater than or equal to 4 divided by 1 plus 1 over n minus 1 or in other words, k is greater than or equal to 4 times n minus 1 by n. You can just clean this up. Or I can claim that k is greater than or equal to 4 times 1 minus 1 by n. Or in other words, k is greater than or equal to 4 minus 4 by n. But if you actually remember, what did we have to prove? We had to prove that this is greater than or equal to 3.999. Right? That is what our initial question was. Prove that for a particular natural number n, this holds. And it holds for at least one natural number n. So basically, you will um, notice that 4 minus 4 by n is greater than or equal to 3.999 or in other words, minus 4 by n is greater than or equal to negative 1 by 1000 or in other words, I can just write that 4 by n is less than or equal to 1 by 1000 or n is greater than or equal to 4000. So basically what is happening is for any integer greater than or equal to 4000, this inequality is proved. What does that mean? That means it at least holds for one natural number n and hence our given result is true, hence proved. Right? So essentially what we've done till now is we've proved part number one. So we've proved for all n greater than or equal to 4000, this results hold true. So for every such sequence, there is an n greater than or equal to one. And is there an n greater than or equal to one? Yes. And we have proved that. So part one is over. Now, let's move on to part number two. Now, in part number two, we need to prove a sequence, right? Essentially, we need to prove a sequence. We need to like, generate a sequence in a way so that it satisfies that given result. What was that result? X naught squared divided by X1 plus X1 squared divided by X2 
all the way up till x n minus 1 squared by x n is less than 4. Essentially, we need to find a sequence. And the question was find a sequence x n, right? Such that this essentially holds for all n belonging to natural numbers. So it holds for all natural numbers, and we need to, in a way, generate a particular, or just, you know, assume a certain sequence that satisfies this. And how do we work with this? Well, mostly, you know, we can just maybe just play around with this a little bit and we'll actually see that some very simple sequences do satisfy this. For example, if I try to take a geometric sequence, if I take an infinite geometric sequence and I'm just going to define that as Xn is equal to R raised to the power N. If I just consider this sequence, you know, as N goes from, you know, one to infinity because it's an infinite sequence, obviously. And so I'll notice that, for example, x0 will be 1, right? x1 will be r, x2 will be r squared, x3 will be r cubed, and you know, it goes so on and so forth. And the general xn is obviously r raised to the power n. Now, if you just remember, there was a condition which I marked as equation number 1, result number 1 x0 needs to be greater than or equal to x1, greater than or equal to x2, and so on and so forth. Subsequent terms are either equal or diminishing in magnitude. What does that mean? That means that this r needs to be between 0 and 1. Right? If it is equal to 1, all terms x0, x1, x2 are equal in magnitude. But if it is you know, somewhere between 0 and 1, that means the term are diminishing in magnitude. Right? So for this condition to hold true, we need to strictly define r in this particular interval. And you'll actually see that this geometric sequence that we define r is for n perfectly satisfies our given inequality for all natural numbers n, which is what we have to prove. Right? I'm just saying that off the bat right now, but we need to prove that. So if you actually notice the left hand side over here, we can actually compute this, right? x0 squared divided by x1 plus x1 squared divided by x2 plus all the little xn minus 1 squared divided by xn. What will this be? This will be nothing but r is power minus 1 plus r is power 0 plus r is power 1. This goes all the little r is power n minus 2. You can just figure this out. Right? As essentially, for example, x0 is basically, what was x0? It was 1. And x1 was r. Right? So x0 squared divided by x1 is 1 by r or r is power minus 1. And similarly, you can find out the other terms as well. Right? So basically, again, I'm just going to use some notation over here. Let's just call this as k. To simplify down our writing work. So k is indeed equal to r s power minus 1 plus r s power 0 plus r s power 1. This goes all the way to r s power n minus 2. And what I can do is I can just take 1 by r common from here. So I'll be left with 1 plus r plus r square. This goes all the way to r s power n minus 1. And if you actually notice this is nothing but a sum of a geometric series, sum of a geometric progression, right? Sum of gp. And we know the formula for a sum of gp. It is basically 1 by r times this becomes 1 minus r s power n divided by 1 minus r. Okay. And at r is equal to 1 by 2. If I just consider this r is equal to 1 by 2, what happens? k is equal to 2 times 1 minus 1 by 2 raised power n divided by 1 minus 1 by 2, which is essentially 1 by 2. So k just becomes 4 times 1 minus 1 by 2 raised power n. Or in other words, k is equal to 4 minus um, 4 times 1 by 2 raised to the power n. So what does that imply? That implies that k is less than 4 for all n belongs to natural numbers because essentially it's subtracting a value from 4. Now, as n becomes very large, this will essentially tend to 4, but it will always be less than 4. For example, it can be 3.999999 for some particular large value of n. But it is always, always, always going to be less than 4. It's never going to touch the value of 4. Right? So therefore, the sequence xn is equal to r raised to power n. But we chose r so that r was 1 by 2 raised to power n. So essentially, this sequence is always less than 4 for all n belong to natural numbers. And that was what we had to find out. We had to find out any one sequence. Right? And it so turns out that this geometric sequence that we found beautifully um, solves our given condition, beautifully satisfies our given condition, and that is the end result. Right? So just to kind of um, write it all down, result number one is satisfied for all natural numbers n greater than or equal to 4,000, and 
in number two, we need to find a sequence and that sequence so happens to be xn is equal to one by two raised to the power n. So yeah, that was very fascinating. And and, and also, 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 if you actually remember, um, we had fixed this r from zero to one, right? And so we really couldn't assume a lot of other values. At here, I assumed r is equal to one by two. You can try with r is equal to one by three, one by four as well and see what you get. But it perfectly satisfies for r is equal to one by two. But remember that r needs to be you know, specific to that interval. Otherwise, you're breaking condition number one. And we do not want to break condition number one at any costs, right? So r is equal to one by two works perfectly and the sequence is one by two raised to the n. So this was a fascinating question. It was a very cool application of the T2's lemma. And we had to work around a couple of things around, in and around T2's lemma. And that is why it is a fascinating inequality. So yeah, I really hope you learned something from that. Okay, so moving on to some book sessions of senior math Olympiads. We have the I am a compendium, polynomials by Barbeu, elementary number theory by Sierpinski, graph theory by Harari, combinatorics by Brualdi, secrets and inequalities, and functional equations and how to solve them by Christopher G. Small. Okay, so we have a similar but challenging problem, and this is a little bit brute force application of the T2's lemma. Uh, let x1, x2 till xn be real numbers, and then I want you to prove this given inequality. So we try this out and if you're able to do this, let me know. Until then, I'll see you the next video. Thank you very much and bye-bye. The programs are designed for students who are passionate about mathematics. And they are personalized with one-on-one -on -one training, individual evaluation and remedial sessions. The reason Chinta students are successful over the last 10 years because they are taught by mathematicians and real Olympiads from leading universities in India, United States and Europe. Some of our students come back to teach at Chinta from Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, MIT, UCLA, ISI, CMI, IITs, TIFR and IISC. For more information, visit Chinta.com.